I do films on the technicality of hi-fi components now and then, breaking down jargon so it's easy to understand the real world need to know terms and tech, but also useful for audiophiles wanting to know my experiences and the pitfalls I've come across. So to DAX first. Assumptions get used in hi-fi reviews, they the terminology. So I make no assumptions and you have to have no prior knowledge, absolutely none, zilch, nada, diddly squat. My attitude is music which Hi-Fi serves is inclusive, so why the hell should Hi-Fi be anything other? Audio devices are now digital, phones, TVs, etc. I think most people can get their head around the concept of digital audio, the ones and zeros of digital code which constitutes a representation of music. If you're buying an integrated hi-fi component which already has a DAC in it, you maybe don't need to worry about buying one as your DAC is already catered for. I'm talking about an amplifier with a DAC, or a streamer with a DAC, or a CD player with a DAC, and so on. This MacBook laptop has a DAC which converts the digital from this Tidal app, or whatever software you use, to analog sound that you're gonna hear, and then it spits it out via this 3.5 millimeter headphone socket. Similarly with an iPhone, except you have to use this 3.5 millimeter adapter port nowadays this pair of Sony Bluetooth headphones must have one. It takes a Bluetooth signal and converts it to analog, so inside there must be a DAC. Cord's Cutest DAC by its simplicity is probably one of the easiest DACs to use to show what a DAC is. It takes digital here and spits out analog here, one for the left channel, one for the right. So too my Hegel H390 amplifier, digital goes in, from your digital source, the internal DAC takes care of it, converts the sound to analog and then sends it onto your speakers. One of my bugbears is that when articles explain what analog sound is, they explain the sound wave as having an amplitude and a frequency, but it doesn't really give the full picture. It doesn't allow, enable you to visualize or conceptualize a sound wave. A wave is basically like a water wave, but with air and compressions of the air. So think of water in a tub with a flat surface that moves in and out like a speaker. I'm using my frying pan spatula in this tub of water, simulating the sound wave and the driver moving backwards and forwards. So that's the sound wave in a nutshell, and the longer the waves, the lower the frequency, so we're talking about bass sounds, the shorter the wave, higher frequencies, i.e. treble. Also, the higher the wave itself, the louder the sound is, as there's greater air pressure. The point of this is, is that analog is a continually varying type of sound. It's true to our environment. Whereas digital is an on and off, in a binary ones and zeros world. Because stereo sound has left and right audio, 
That's why the output from a DAC has a left and right channel. For music that DACs can handle, loosely you'll hear the terms Red Book CD, which is the CD disc standard, then CD quality streams or files, similarly high res streams or files, and the same with DSD and MQA. Technically MQA isn't a format because it relates to how music is packaged in the file. Audio files are of course interested in lossless formats as opposed to lossy, and this means not packaging the musical data into a smaller space in the file. All these formats I've mentioned are lossless. I'm not going into full detail about sample rates, bit rates and formats here, but click on the card above for my article streaming, which does. Think of bit rates as chunks of data on offer, so 16 bit for CD or say 24 bit for high res. And the sample rate refers to how much data is in each chunk sampled each second. Obviously different DACs handle different formats and sample and bit rates too. Is it a buying consideration? I'll come on to this. Another thing you'll often hear people refer to is PCM formats, which for all intents and purposes relates to many types of sound quality files, but predominantly you hear it referred to CD quality and high res. PCM means pulse code modulation, and you can have a PCM flat file or WAV file or Apple lossless file, for instance. Most know that these are codecs for how the music is packaged in the electronic file. Different DACs, of course, handle different types of codecs. But PCM is a means where an analog waveform is converted into a digital form of that waveform, so it can be in the digital file or domain. The code translates to a representation of the analog signal that we then hear. I'm a massive radio control model aircraft nut, and the giant models that I used to fly used to use PCM receivers to transfer analog airbound FM signals into a PCM digital signal for better accuracy and less FM interference. The signal will then have to be converted back into analog in the receiver because the servo motors that moved flight surfaces would be in the analog domain. common digital input connection to a DAC is interchangeably called SPDIF, RCA or coaxial, which most audiophiles obviously know to be this type of plug. SPDIF means Sony Philips Digital Interface, which was developed by Sony and Philips when the CD player came out in the 80s. It's called RCA because of the Radio Corporation of America who developed the plug in the 1930s. Coaxial 2 because it has an inner hot signal connected to the pin and an outside coaxial wire mesh that is grounded so interference on the outside mesh can dissipate. This connection is unbalanced or what's called single-ended which basically means you don't have another inverse or out of phase copy of the signal like you do in a balance cable where you have another pin and wire such that you can remove noise along the cable when polarity is flipped and the two wires are effectively compared against one another. You don't get that with a single-ended cable. An RCA cable incorporates the digital music signal 
and the clock signal used to time the data in one. Like with this Cord Qtist, DACs often have BNC coaxial connections, which stands for Bayonet Neil Conselman after the bayonet fitting of the connection and Neil Conselman after the inventors. You'll often hear people talk of it being a true 75 ohm impedance digital connection, reputedly unlike RCA coaxial digital. And this is because the BNC con connection or construction, the terminals, are fit for 75 ohms. By having a certain impedance, in other words, electrical resistance, you ensure that the whole signal gets all the way down the line without any loss. I've never actually heard people say BNC sounds better than RCA, but if you are spending more on a DAC, you will get BNC terminals in any event, so you might as well use them. I squared S is another digital input connection which preserves the clock and signal wires separately. Because there isn't a standardized connection for I squared S, you'll often see a DAC use a TV type HDMI plugs, which can use different pins for the clock and signal wires, such as that used on DACs from PS Audio, like the DirectStream, or the Venus 2 R2R ladder DAC from Denifrips. Optical or TOSLINK is a fiber optic connection which uses pulses of light to convey binary digital code. Depending on the DAC, RCA coax can sound better than TOSLINK and vice versa. Always see what you prefer is my advice. The theoretical limit of TOSLINK in signal quality bandwidth is 24 bit 96 kilohertz, but it is possible to go higher. For instance, Marantz amps like the PM7000N go to 192 kilohertz. USB digital audio can sound sublime Look for USB 2 into a DAC, which is an asynchronous type, so you can benefit from using the clock in your DAC, which I think most people know about. AES-EBU is a balanced digital connection which uses XLR three pin plugs. You don't necessarily want to be picking the DAC based on inputs unless you have to. Sometimes you just find out that it comes down to what works best and preference. If you can afford it, a balanced DAC used with other balanced gear will confer sonic advantages. Normally, analog outputs will be an RCA connection, but on pricier DACs, you get XLR2, which confer the balance advantages that I've talked about. R2R ladder DACs are the original old school type DAC that were first developed. They use banks of resistors to do the conversion for each step in bit depth. Think of DACs like Denifrips or those from brands like Aqua. Most modern DACs are the Delta Sigma variety. So think of chips from brands like ESS Sabre, Wolfson and Burr Brown. These are what are affectionately known as off-the-shelf DAC chips that are not configurable. On the other hand, FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array, which does sound really techy and involved, is a type of DAC that uses a number of switches or taps which are configurable during the design. Exponents of FPGA are PS Audio and Cord Electronics. And with the PS Audio Direct Stream, you can update the FPGA to different versions of code, which changes sound quality of the DAC subtly. If you're gonna be picking hi-fi DACs based on specs or type, you're gonna get yourself into a real pickle 
because you can never really tell what a DAC is going to sound like on type alone. My advice is use common sense. Pick them on price, reputation, credible reviews, how frequently they sell at your dealer, which your dealer can tell you, and what users online say in their comparative tests. Because I seem to spend half my life online and I've got a good feel for what people buy, amongst some audiophiles, I think there is an over-reliance of the digital transport source, but an under-reliance on DAC quality in the DAC, which I think can much more make or break the sound of a hi-fi. I've seen this so much when I ask people about their hi-fi gear. This is, I think, because the DAC and its analog output is so, so important in the overall chain of a hi-fi. As an example of this, this is actually my first CD player I ever bought. And by the way, it's a right pile of crap, but it is actually 30 years old. I've got it hooked up to my hi-fi system using its own DAC, and it may have been a budget player of the time, but I can't begin to tell you how shockingly bad it actually sounds. And I actually think a large part of that is undoubtedly down to the DAC, which being 30 year old tech is gonna be bad. Anyone for pancakes? Keep the DAC separate and you can exploit better DACs in upgrades in the future. There are a number of good reasons for doing this. First of all, inbuilt DACs can be a compromise when they're used in amps or streamers as manufacturers often use lesser DACs in such units compared to standalone DACs, which compete better by being just, well, a DAC. The level at which DACs compete in an all-in-one component at a relatively high price is lower than people actually think. DAC technology is moving so, so fast. So a DAC inside a stream or amp might actually be out of fashion in two to three years time. So in other words, going down the separate route, you preserve your investment more and change bits that matter only when you need to. Conundrum of formats is a massive area, I think, of misdirection in, in hi-fi. When I get a product, you know, the last thing that I'm going to do is look at whether it can handle DSD this or MQA that and get really embroiled in minute differences between lossless formats. I mean, what is OG Vorbis? Although I do actually think that's a, a compressed format. I mean, I'm not going to sit there testing it. Why would I do that? Ever since the high-res logo came out, I think it's tricked people into believing that you have to have high-res or DSD. And I think it's good to have higher sample rates, but it isn't the be-all and end-all. It's about the DAC and its performance at CD levels, I'd say. And if you want to get decent improvements, don't start worrying about formats but invest in a better DAC or just a slightly different DAC at the same price because the quality of audio is almost incidental to formats against improving DAC quality. I know that it's natural for people to want to get best out of what they have, but don't make it an academic or technical exercise. Just get on with listening to music is my attitude and do that through improving 
your DAC. Also, next time you spend $2,000 on a CD transport or streamer, put that money into the DAC itself and go for a better DAC. Rather than DSD this or MQA that, I can guarantee you'll get better sound quality. I know also that I'm not the only one to say this, but it is so, so true. Also, the better power supply the DAC uses means less noise will find its way to the analog output. The better it can handle jitter, which is about time distortions of the digital audio signal, the better it's going to sound as well. The same could be said of the quality of the analog output. I think that some people might think I'm a bit of a nut job for saying this, but you can actually put a compressed MP3 file through something like a premium Core Dave DAC, and in the right system, it will actually sound better than high res into a much lesser DAC. It's not just about the DAC chip too, so never get fixated by saying things like FPGA is superior to Delta Sigma. I got myself on that one some time back and it's dispelled when you hear something like a Hegel Mohican CD player which uses a bog standard off the shelf chip but uses a really good analog output and it can sound better than some FPGAs. Thanks for watching my little video. I hope you got something out of it. It wasn't meant to be overly technical. None of my stuff really is. I believe that audio is for everyone. I like to give my experiences of hi-fi and give my thoughts and I hope that I've done it in this film. Again, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.